morning and welcome to worship here in the Old Kirk. Morning. morning. Just a couple of uh, intimations to draw your attention to, if I can find the order of service. The, there will be a car treasure hunt on Sunday the 23rd of June, 2 p.m. at the Mans. It starts at 2 p.m. at the Mans. Where it finishes is entirely up to you. Um, some people might be coming back to the Mans, but um, others might not be. Um, but if you'd like to come along, um, next week there'll be a sheet in the vestibule. If you can just put your name down, just to give us a rough idea of numbers um, for catering purposes. Uh, throughout the next couple of months, the church is open between 10 and 12 on a Saturday uh, for June, July, August. Uh, if you speak to Fiona or Mita um, and add your name to the list, if you can spare an hour or so uh, just to help people on that day uh, or those days, that would be great again. There is a list in the vestibule if you'd like to do so. And the rest of the intimations you can read at your leisure. I'm going to ask Alan if he would light um, a prayer candle. <laughs> because I forgot to ask somebody else and he's nearest. <laughs> Sorry, Alan. Thank you. And I'll let you get back to your seat before I announce the first hymn. Let's worship God as we sing, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You. Let us pray. Sovereign God, beginning and end of all, ruler over time and space, we acknowledge you as the one and only God. Hear us in your mercy, redeem and restore us. We worship you in your majesty. We praise you for your greatness. We thank you for your guidance. Forgive us for the way we fall into worshipping idols rather than you putting you second to our other interests and concerns, imagining we know all there is to know of you, tying you down to our limited understanding. Hear us in your mercy, redeem and restore us. Forgive us for attempting to direct your will and dictate your actions, preferring our way to yours as though we know better than you. 
Forgive us for losing sight of your love, refusing your grace, overlooking your blessings, frustrating your purpose. Hear us in your mercy. Redeem and restore us. Forgive us the mistakes we make, the sins we fall into, the hurt we cause through straying from your side. Sovereign God, teach us more day by day of your greatness, of all that you are and all you have done. And so may we give you the worship and service that is rightly yours. Hear us in your mercy. Redeem and restore us. And hear us now as we continue to pray together in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Jan Sterling to read our lessons. First reading is from, it, from Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord. All the earth burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. We sing number 37 in Mission Praise, As the Deer Pants for the Water.
second reading is from Acts 10, verses 1 to 16. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. Here ends the second reading. Praise be to God for these readings from his holy word, and to him be all glory and praise. Amen. Thank you, John. We sing, Jesus, the joy of loving hearts.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Father, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today we come to one of the greatest turning points in the history of the Christian church. If the event about which we are going to look at had not happened, then not a single one of us would be in church today. If I were to ask you who was responsible for encouraging Gentiles into the church, what would your answer be? Many people would, of course, suggest that the Apostle Paul is the one who ought to be credited with that idea. And they would be able to make a strong case for that assertion. But I would like to suggest that there were at least two others involved in the process of opening the eyes of the Jewish Christian church to the need to allow others to become part of God's family without having to convert to Judaism. Today we're going to look at the events leading up to the conversion of a man called Cornelius. Why is his conversion so important? Well, Cornelius was the first non-Jew, the first Gentile, to be allowed into the church. If he had been refused entry, then the church might never have freed itself from the shackles of its Jewish roots. And we might never have had the opportunity of hearing the wonderful news about Jesus, the Son of God. Cornelius was a Roman centurion, a man who had traveled the world and experienced many different ways of looking at life. He was called God-fearing, suggesting that he was one of those people who attended the synagogue, but did not accept the authority of the law or the need for circumcision. He believed in the concept of the one true God, and the synagogue was the only place he could worship such a God. We're also told that he was charitable and a man of prayer. In other words, Cornelius was already living out his life in a Christian-like manner. He just didn't know it. The importance of his conversion and his acceptance into the church comes from the fact that this marked a complete change in the attitude of Jewish Christians. Because up until this point, they had carried on the traditional contempt that Jews had always shown for non-Jewish people. The attitude of the Jewish prayer that thanked God for not making a man a slave, a woman, or a Gentile was still strong in the new church. So for Cornelius to be accepted required a major change in attitude amongst the members of the new church. And of course, God arranged for such a thing to happen. Peter, still the leader of the new church, had gone to Joppa and was staying at the house of a man called Simon the Tanner. One day at noon, as we heard, Peter left the hustle and bustle of the busy house and had gone to the flat roof upstairs to pray. As he lay under the awning, raised above the roof to protect people from the sun, he had fallen asleep, and God had spoken to him in a dream. Out of heaven came a large sheet, maybe the awning under which he lay, and it contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds of the air. And then Peter heard a voice say, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And this happened three times. So that Peter would be in no doubt about who was talking to him. Then he wakes up. And he begins to ponder the meaning of his dream. And very quickly he began to understand that God was telling him to begin breaking down the barriers that separated people from each other and from God. He began to realize that God had no favorites, that he loved the whole world, and that Jesus hadn't come just to die for the Jews, but for everyone. Peter realized that the church had to change. It had to become more open and welcoming to anyone that God brought to them. And this must have been a shocking realization for Peter. But we should remember that he had already been moving away from the strict obedience 
to the law. Because during his stay in Joppa, he was with Simon the Tanner. And tanners, by the very nature of their work, deal with dead bodies. And were therefore in a permanent state of uncleanliness, according to the law. And anyone living with them was also unclean by association. Before becoming a disciple, Peter would never have stayed at Simon's house. But since Simon was a Christian, Peter felt it was okay. His dream was simply an extension of what he already believed in his heart. Only now, God had given him the freedom to express it. And one of the things I love about our God is that he is so full of surprises that he's always teaching us new things about himself. And just as we think we've got him pinned down, he does something different. And we're all at sea again. If there is one thing I know about being a Christian, is that it is, it is never boring. Peter was beginning to discover that. He thought that having spent three years with Jesus, that he had a fair idea of who God was and what God liked. But now he saw that his vision of God was far too small. That God was far bigger and more full of surprises than he could ever have imagined. And that still rings true for us today. We've tried to make a division between our religious life and our secular life. We have divorced what we do on a Sunday from what we do the other six days. But remember, God made all seven days. And our lack of understanding and our blindness goes deeper than that. All too often we assume that the root of the national church's problem lies with decline. We see the preservation of the institution as the main aim of Christians in the 21st century. Keep the national church going. Keep buildings open at all costs. When really what we should be doing is sharing the gospel of Jesus and offering a helping hand to the people of Scotland as they make their own spiritual journey through life. And if we do that, and it's God's will that the national church should survive, then the buildings that we cherish will flourish. If it's not God's will, then we should be open to whatever new thing it is he wants us to do in this land. We are called to be a faithful and obedient people. We need to get rid of the idea that assumes that if people don't come to church or profess their belief in God, then they cannot be of any value to him. What about the scientist selfishly seeking to cure AIDS or cancer? They are involved in a sacred task. Just as the man or woman on their knees praying for God's guidance in their life is doing a sacred thing. The carer who helps someone wash and dress in the morning is doing God's work. Just as someone who sits on a pew on a Sunday morning. Self-centered worship that excludes people from God's presence is as secular an act as the businessman who thinks only of profit. What counts as the motivation? If the motivation is positive, then it's God-given. Maybe the scientist doesn't understand why he or she has a desire to find a cure. But that desire can still be God-given. As is the desire to sing God's praise. And one of our tasks in the church is to help that scientist or that carer understand their calling is also from God. The story of Cornelius and Peter is all about realizing that God's picture of the church is far bigger and more detailed than ours will ever be. And we need to keep discovering the new things that God wants us to do. Otherwise, we're tying the hands of God. More of us need to dream as Peter dreamt, so that God can speak to us and free us from the shackles that hold us back from discovering the new things he has planned for us. So that we can be prepared to play our full part 
in building his kingdom here in this place. Let me put this before you. A few years ago, we sold the farm or part of the farm that has meant we have been able to repair and refurbish the halls. And having made them all shiny, bright and new again, the question is, are we going to keep them all to ourselves? Or are we going to throw open the doors and welcome everyone in? The session has already decided that we should throw open the doors. And I hope that you will agree. The proof that Peter understood what God was trying to teach him through his dream comes almost immediately. Three men arrive asking for him, revealing that they are from the Gentile Cornelius. And Peter immediately asks them into his house. Not an unusual event in the very hospitable East. That is until you realize that the three men are not Jews. And that Peter has just broken one of the most important of the laws of the Jewish faith. Don't break bread with the Gentiles. Peter is beginning to understand what God is trying to teach him. That we are all equal in the sight of God. And that everyone deserves to experience the same standard of decency and respect. On hearing their request, he agrees to travel with them to meet Cornelius. And on arriving at the centurion's house, he waits at the door until Cornelius invites him in. Here again, we see Peter practicing what God is teaching him. He doesn't assume that as a Jew and as a disciple of Jesus, that he has the right to enter someone's house without an invitation. Peter is beginning to break down the barriers that had separated Jew from Gentile. He was overcoming the hurdles in a way that would allow people like Paul and Barnabas to reach out to the Gentiles later. By his actions, Peter was opening the arms of the church to welcome any sinner who wanted to enter. But he wasn't doing it in a condescending way or out of any sense of superiority. He was doing it in the way Jesus would have done. How we need that kind of awareness and understanding today. How many of us feel morally superior to those outside the church? How many of us rush in with hobnail boots when we try to talk to others about Jesus? How many people have we turned away from Jesus because we've been insensitive and uncaring? Rigid in our view of what is right or wrong. Stubbornly certain that we know the mind of God. Part of our duty as Christians is to learn how to break down barriers, not to build them up. Like Peter, we have to learn to be sensitive. We have to appreciate the views of people who think differently from us, who believe in other gods, who practice different faiths. And at this time in, our, in particular, when our nation is split politically, we have to be the glue that holds the whole nation together. We don't have to agree with everyone, but we must be respectful. Because that's the only way that we will gain their respect in return. And that's the only way that they will see Jesus in the flesh. It's a chastening thought to think that those outside the church can only see Jesus through us. What kind of a picture of Jesus do we present to the world? Are we legalistic and authoritarian like the Pharisees? Or are we like Peter, struggling to present as honestly as we can the true likeness of Christ? A man who always had his arms outstretched to welcome anyone who was looking for him. That is the challenge of this story. To portray Jesus in a positive way to those who do not know him. And the last thing I want to point out about this story is that in the verses 34 to 43 of chapter 10, we discover one of the most concise and practical summaries of what the New Testament is all about. In these few verses, Peter encapsulates the whole of the good news. That Jesus was God's gift to the whole world. That he exercised a ministry of healing. 
that he died on the cross in our place, that he rose again, that we are to tell others of Jesus and his work, and that what Jesus did has wiped our slates clean with God. If you ever wanted to sum up what you believed as a Christian, if you ever wanted to share with someone what really matters to you, then those verses are it. The story of Peter and Cornelius is the story of the church growing up and throwing its doors wide open. It's the story of God's love spilling out into the whole world. It is the story of barriers being broken down. It is a story that we need to relearn today. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these thoughts. And to his name be the praise and the glory. Let's worship God with our offering. Let us pray. Father God, in this very special day, we remember the generosity of your love and for all that you have provided for us. Today, as a token of our love and appreciation, we bring this, our offering, before you, asking that you would accept it, bless it, and use it, that your kingdom might grow. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, this is a joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. And according to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the table of our Savior who invites those who trust him to share the feast he has prepared. We sing our communion hymn, Ye Gates, Lift Up Your Heads on High.
remain standing to confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, out of the fullness of your gifts, we offer you this bread and this cup. By the blood of your Son, you have opened up for us a new and living way into your presence. Help us in faith to enter with him, and grant that being pure in heart through grace, we may share in this immortal sacrifice. In his name we pray. Amen. Friends in the Lord, attend to the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by St. Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, I take these elements of bread and wine to be set apart from all common use to this holy use and mystery. And as he gave thanks and blessed, let us draw near to God and present to him our prayers and our thanksgivings. Let us pray. Father of mercy and God of all comfort, we acknowledge you to be Lord of all, and at all times we honor your greatness and glory. Firstly, because you created us in your own image and likeness, but chiefly because you freed us from the enslavement of sin through Jesus. You gave him in love to be made man, like us in all things except sin, that by his death and resurrection he might bring again life to the world. Lord, we are not able in our dullness to understand the breadth and length and height and depth of your love. But true to his commandment, we come to this table, which he has left to us, to be used in remembrance of his death until he comes again. Here we declare and witness before the world that through Christ alone we have received liberty and life. You have claimed us as children and heirs. You have freely bestowed your grace upon us and you have raised us into your spiritual kingdom. They are to eat and drink with you at that most joyful table of eternal life. In this present time, we on earth have communion with you in heaven. But in the time to come, we shall be raised to that endless joy, prepared for us before the foundation of the world was laid. We acknowledge that we have received these wonderful gifts by your free mercy and grace through your only Son, Jesus Christ. And moved by your Holy Spirit, we, your people, give you all thanks, praise, and glory forever and ever. Amen. According to the holy institution of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for a memorial of him we do this, who in the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had blessed and given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed with my blood. This do as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, grant us your peace.
Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. This cup is a new covenant sealed with my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And if you'd like to share that peace by shaking hands with those around you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the love which brings us food from heaven, the life of your dear Son, and assures us that we belong to the company of all his faithful people in heaven and on earth. Grant that strengthened by this fellowship and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may continue his work in the world until we come to the glory of your eternal kingdom. 
This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, You Shall Go Out With Joy, and we'll sing it. And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love, now and evermore. God bless and keep safe.